Hello, and welcome back to the Growth Circle podcast. I'm your host, Lincoln Amstutz, and today we've got Josh Belk joining us on the podcast. Very excited to have him here with us. And before I bring him on, uh, just a little bit about him. So Josh is a 23-year-old investor and business owner based in Springfield, Missouri. After graduating from Missouri State, Josh started his company, Belk Mobile Detailing, which is now the leading vehicle cleaning business in all of Southwest Missouri. Josh is a good friend of mine and has demonstrated his ability to work hard, take calculated risks, and build systems and a successful business from an early age. So without further ado, Josh, welcome to the Growth Circle Podcast. Right on. Thanks for having me on, Lincoln. This yeah, sweet. yeah, absolutely. Well, from the early stages of your business, you know, I've noticed you've set yourself apart from the competition, not only by providing high quality work, but also marketing yourself as a premium service provider through your website and your social medias. How important is the brand appearance to a company uh, like yours in mobile detailing? Well, I think it's everything. I mean, at least for what we're going for, because we're going for those premium luxury and exotic vehicles, ideally. So we have like a professional photographer that we pay $1,200 a month just specifically for increasing our brand's um, appearance online. And so we invest a lot of money and time into into that just because if we're going for those clients that drive those nicer vehicles, the business owners and uh, professionals that you know tend to really value a professionalism, um, we want to show that we also embody that. Um, so, I mean, we wear collared shirts and we have good photos and videos um, and we really try to focus on our communication. Yeah. Yeah. It makes sense. I mean, if you have that target audience, you've got to tailor the business somewhat to just an experience that they're going to enjoy and that's going to attract those types of people. How did you choose that specifically, that, that, uh, segment, I guess, or, um, you know, those standards within mobile detailing, uh, that target audience, how did that come about versus just trying to appeal to the masses perhaps? I guess it's who I always wanted to be like, you know, like I thought about like myself personally, um, where do I want to be? And then, uh, maybe some of the people that I really admire and, um, I looked at them and created a customer profile and thought, where do those people spend their time? What do those people like to buy the brands that they use, uh, their mannerisms. And we tried to create a car detailing service that is the perfect service for them. So like another thing we notice amongst those those people is they all hate waiting. Most people nowadays hate waiting. So we've built out our team to where we have only about a week wait time. And if we go over a week, we start looking for more team members. Um, we also have everything online. So if people need prices, if they want to book, they can book online. They can see prices online. So another thing I've noticed amongst that crowd of business owners and professionals is that they don't like to call in a lot of the times. We have lots of high net worth clients that prefer booking online, whereas every other detailer, whenever I was starting the business, and probably up to this point too, I still keep an eye on the competition a little bit, does not offer those online service services like we do. Like They don't offer the online booking, and a lot of them don't even have their prices online. You have to call in to get a quote. So... We, uh, we obs are obsessed about perfecting our service and our, uh, and our website and our social media to target those ideal clients. Yeah. Yeah. And I definitely want to go into more detail on those specifics and just noticing those details that your clients are looking for and what, you know, how that sets you apart and is going to cause growth naturally. But can you give us some context for, I guess, what your company does as a whole and the different services it provides, and maybe even how much business you all at this point are doing weekly, monthly, um, right now? Yeah. So we provide, we keep it simple, and we provide four services, but mainly three. Our highest earning service is our full detail, so full shebang inside and out. A lot of people end up just going with their interior because it's a little bit cheaper um, they may not need the outside done. They may just prefer to take it through a car wash. Uh, the third one is just the exterior detail, which we really rarely do. And that's why I don't even consider that um, 
one of the service, but occasionally we get someone that just wants the outside done. And then our uh, ceramic coatings is our fourth service, which we've really been um, selling a lot of within the past few weeks. And it's a great direction that we're wanting to take our business because it appeals even more so to people that take care of their cars because it's a higher costing service um, that only a select few people that really care about their cars and want them uh, protected and shiny, um, only those kind of people are willing to to pay for and afford. So um, at this point, we are uh, we book about August. I think we had a hundred and oh, I have the number. It's like 110 appointments, new appointments booked, 110, 120. Um, September was 89. Um, that's people. Now, whenever one person books, sometimes they book four cars. So I think we end up doing about 150 to 200 cars a month. Um, average price at around $300. Um, sometimes that average varies. You know, we do interiors for 200 250 we do fulls for 300 to 400 on average and the ceramic coatings they tend to average around six seven eight hundred dollars we are running a special right now because we just opened up a new shop so we uh we do mobile because of the convenience of it but we uh we're um expanding more into our physical location shop just because uh it's uh it was needed. We were noticing a lot of people were wanting to drop their cars off and we were doing a lot of pickups and, and bring back to, to our house was what we were working at before. So we just knew we needed to shop. So that was kind of the next um, step a few months ago that we decided to invest. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Go, go into that a little bit more because I was curious why initially even you, you went the mobile detailing route versus a physical location, um, kind of the decision making behind that. And then now with the volume that you're doing, the necessity to have a physical spot, uh, what, what was the decision making behind that to start and then now getting this um, off the ground? I think to start, we went mobile because no one else offered it. And again, going back to like becoming obsessed about our ideal market, we knew that they would probably want a service done at their house because of convenience. Like business owners, busy professionals just don't have the time to bring their car somewhere and be without their car for a day or two. So that's why we started out with that. And the reason why we've expanded into the shop is just because naturally like the course of the business has just pulled us that way. Like it, it just makes sense. So for a while there, I thought that maybe we may never have a shop and we may get vans and have our vans outfitted to service even more people and do them even quicker mobily. But what we found was that we had to have a shop because there was a lot of people that were asking about dropping it off, you know, um, and for the service that we're wanting to expand into and, and even some future plans of ours with a year or two out, we knew we needed to have a shop. So that was just the next step in the, uh, in, in our journey that we're, we're trying to go uh, down. So, um, and I, I think that since we've had the shop, people take us a little bit more serious now, at least a certain type of clientele we've noticed a significant uptick in like our ceramic coating since opening the shop. And I think that is in part due to those kind of clients want to see you have a brick and mortar location that you've really invested a lot of money and time into. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense is there's just naturally a credibility there of you've got a physical presence and, you know, it's even just essentially that structure and some skin in the game, right? Of like, you you've done this long enough where you're able to afford and to build this out that is going to provide an even better you know service to certain people and so are they bringing the vehicle to you in that case or are you still going and picking it up from their their house and then taking it there and then bringing it back yeah a lot of the times we're picking it up from their house to be as convenient as possible but uh we do still have people that bring it to us but uh, a lot of pickups man a lot. Is, did, was there it's a little surprising, you know, especially with some of these nicer vehicles, like there's obviously an element of trust that has to happen of they're willing to give you their vehicle, you know, you're, you're getting in it, you're driving it away in there. Was that ever a problem of, you know, getting people to, to be fine with that? Or is it a matter of, Hey, you know, they're the ones choosing this. They have the option of dropping it off. Yeah. You would think if you had like a hundred thousand dollar car, you wouldn't want people to drive it, but We've never had a problem with those people. It's actually the people that sometimes have like basic Hondas, Toyotas, 
that give us the most trouble. In fact, yesterday that was the case with a lady that was asking for our uh, like proof of insurance for her 2012 mm-hmm. Honda Civic. Um, so it's funny how it works like that, but we've almost never had a problem with people that have really nice cars, like with letting us drive yeah. it. Uh, even brand new, like you'd think if you bought a 2023, 2024 vehicle, at least for a little while, you would really want only yourself driving it. I've got a guy who just bought a brand new F-250 and he's letting me drive it within like a week of him getting it. So like go to his house, pick it up, and bring it back. So it's surprising. There's a lot of trust there and we take that extremely serious with our business and we really do everything we can to make sure that we um, keep that trust and continue to build that trust. Yeah, I mean, you guys are probably driving these vehicles before uh, most of their family members are, so uh, quite the honor <laughs> yeah. on there, but I'm sure that's, you know, that's it neat is. too, just working with a variety of vehicles. I mean, I'm, you know, I would say I'm somewhat a car guy myself, so I just like the idea of working with and around cars, especially nicer ones, and then you've got this clientele that, you know, I'm sure is is nice to work for as well because they're used to dealing at a certain level of, you know, of business and, and personalities around them. So that's, yeah, I, I like the choice that you've made in, in focusing in there. And I mean, for you going back to even, you know, you're at Missouri State, you graduate. Did you know that you wanted to go into uh, owning your own business and in car detailing and all of this? Or did that come after the fact? What was the process there like? Well, when I graduated, I wanted to become a financial advisor, and I went to work for Mass Mutual in St. Louis for about a year. Um, and I had get, I had gotten all my license before graduating. I had really worked on that hard my last year of school. I had to take like three tests, so I wanted to knock those all out before I graduated and stepped into uh, the advising career. Then I did. So that last semester was really focused on that and less on my business. And I had actually transferred over ownership to my brother, who's a partner with me. Um, not all, but I transferred over a significant piece of ownership to him so that I could clear up some mental space and focus on my my new career. But I learned once I got into uh, the financial advising business that there was a lot of things that just didn't make sense for me. Like the more I got to know myself and my strengths and my weaknesses, uh, I, I realized that that career in particular was not something for me. Like I wasn't going to be, I could do well, but I wouldn't excel at it. So they, uh, it, it felt like I was in a box and my creativity was limited. So I, I needed, I needed to be in an industry in which the regulations weren't so high and that I had more autonomy over the things that I can control. I wanted to control all aspects of my business because I felt like only then would I be able to really do well. Um, and see like huge growth. Right, right. I, I think that's a huge aspect is, you know, a lot of guys, they have that, you know, th- the nature within them that wants to have more of an influence on their success rather than just a predetermined outcome that a lot of jobs offer. I mean, even within, say, sales or commission-based job, um, a lot of the times you, you can earn as much as you're willing to work, but you're still not growing your own company. It's still somebody else's company, somebody else's business versus you. You know, what you're doing is you're stepping into your own business, something that you can determine the success or the failure of based off of the amount of work and ingenuity and thought you put into it. And so th- there's something about that, you know, that I also resonate with in that you know, you're stepping out into a little bit of the unknown, but you get to control that based off of how uh, much work you put in and, and, you know, that the systems and such that follow. So I can completely understand that decision making to go this route. And so how, how long has that been now that you've been fully within Belk Mobile Detailing and just working on this? So it was March 2021 that I really stepped over full time back into the uh, detailing business and kind of took the reins back from my brother. Yeah. So that's been, um, what, over two years now, two years, six months, Mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And then with that, go into a little bit of, so it sounds like you and your brother were there together early on. What does it look like growing your team, and when did you realize you needed to bring more people on? And, and, you know, what's that setup nowadays look like with everybody that's involved? Yeah, well, my brother and I, we did details by ourselves for 
the first year. Austin mainly, my brother, mainly doing the details. I helping him out more with the back end of things, the admin, answering the phone. But um, yeah, at about a year in, we actually had someone reach out to us that uh, she she worked for us um, actually up until last week. She's actually moving on, which is for the best for her. But uh, she worked for us for three years and she reached out to us. So we set up an interview. And I, I don't think at the time we necessarily needed an employee, but it was nice to have someone helping because I we felt like it was a, a step in the right direction. So she helped Austin out, um, kind of alleviated some stress with him and sped up our our process, made things more efficient. But uh, then, then about a year from then, we we really started to our our demand started to pick up, and we realized like we were having a, a month wait time which I see a lot of people in all kinds of industries have, which is kind of a cool thing to brag about, but it's horrible for the customer. So we can we can brag that we're booked out for a month or two. And I mean, that's cool, but your cancellations go up significantly when that happens. And it just is an awful customer service experience because especially with detailing, you're so you're at the beck and call the weather. So if it rains or if it's too cold, you can't do the detail. But if my month is full, I can't reschedule that person for tomorrow necessarily. I may have to wait another month after they've waited a month. So so we quickly learned that we had to expand our team to increase our sales and to improve our customer service experience, make sure that we were continuing to maintain a five-star review. Um, and so the first person, we hired a part-time guy uh, he reached out to us again, just like our first employee. But then the first person that really became our like full-time uh, main employee who's still with us today and does an amazing job, I reached out to him. So I was in a Facebook group of detailers and just happened to stumble upon this guy's post uh, one day, actually at the exact moment that I was beginning to transfer back to full-time detailing. So it was perfect timing almost to the day, kind of crazy how that worked out. So I reached out to him and we got coffee and I made him an offer to come work for us because he was just starting his detailing business here in, in Springfield, but he didn't have any customers. And so he had a lot of work to do. So he came and worked for us and, and kind of got a head start on uh, on his his career that way and continues to work with us to this day. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. And I, I like what you were saying about you took a proactive approach to the amount of business that you were receiving because I, I experienced that all the time being in real estate and hiring subcontractors and people that we need to help complete projects. Uh, they're, yeah, that often talk about, oh, you know, yeah, we're we're two months out. We're, we're six months out, right? And and some of that is ordering and things outside of their control. But there's other other things that it's like they you know, they've just filled up their schedules and, and you could have been that same way and, and kept those, that month of, you know, scheduling out. But instead you're like, look, we know the cancellations are going to go up. Like you're saying, let's take the approach of cutting that down to a week to provide the best customer experience. And when we do that, those people are going to want to come back again. People are going to be willing to book with us when they know they're not going to have to wait a month and the business will grow. And I, I do think, oddly, a lot of people miss that. They they just get just satisfied with having a full calendar rather than knowing that this means your company can grow if you take advantage of it. And so I think that's a, that's a huge element that you you jumped on there. And I'm curious, I mean, is, is, the, com, is the mobile detailing space fairly competitive? Um, I mean, maybe even in general, but in our area, um, do you see or... Is that, has that ever really played a factor in you getting the business that you want? It definitely is competitive. We see people join every day. Like my brother's always joking that he's got a new friend that just started doing detailing. <laughs> I'm sure you've seen that with real estate too, though. Yes. But I'm sure the same with real estate. What you've probably found is that the people at the top, they are there for a reason. And to overtake them is a lot harder than it it seems. So we have a lot of competitors, but we compete with a select few people. Um, and we get most of our business from word of mouth and from Google. So when you think about that, 80% at least from Google and word of mouth, if not 90%. So when you think about that, on Google, we're ranked number one 
for many keywords in Springfield. And if you're searching for car detailing near me or car detailing Springfield, a lot of the times there's something psychologically that just makes you want to go with the highest rated, which we are, or the person that ranks at the top of Google. So we don't have much competition there. I mean, we're competing with like slot number two and three, but if you have half as much reviews as us and you don't have online booking and you don't have your prices listed and you don't look as professional as us, which one are you going to go with? So it's actually a pretty easy decision and word of mouth, clearly you don't have much competition because if you're asking a friend, where's a good place to get my car detailed, or they're telling you, I had this amazing experience you're not necessarily going to go online and shop. And it becomes less and less about the price at that point. You're not competing on price. So you can raise your price because people are coming to you because my friend said so, not because you've got this great deal for a super cheap detail. And how how did you you know, figure out your pricing in such early on? I mean, were you absorbing a lot of content online about other people who had built detailing businesses? Were you talking to people in person? Or was it just trial and error of, I'm going to try this price out, see what the response is, and then now you're able to move it up because of this ecosystem you've built and the clientele. How, how did you decide that? So when we started, we I think our full detail was 50 bucks, and we had a discount at the time for uh, $30. So like our first detail I ever remember doing for someone that wasn't like a family or a friend was uh, $30 for the full thing. Now we weren't doing quite as much as we were now, but I think it still took us like at least three hours. So $10 an hour for the company. Um, so that was just kind of a, a guessing. I mean, at that, po- at that point, we just wanted clients. It didn't matter about what we were charging, you know? So that's the most important thing for us was just getting experience, getting clients, getting photos and videos to use, getting reviews. Um, and then we started raising our price as we got more customers. I think we raised it up to like 60 or $70 for our full detail and then 120. And of course this is taking place over several months. And then eventually you're doing detail, full, full details for 150, 200, 250, 300, 400, 500. And it just kind of kept climbing. I mean, I think everything has gone up over the past three years, it's particularly, uh, service businesses. So a lot of our clients that were with us in the beginning, even if they come back three years later and book with us, they are understandable that um, the prices have gone up, but uh, they've gone up a lot since then. And it's just really been a, a thing of like testing, you know, seeing, hey, if we raise our price 50 bucks, what's the response for the customers over the next few months? Like, are we booking less? Um, is that a direct result of the price or is that, are we not ranking as high in Google or is our website not seeing as much traffic, right? So causation versus correlation is also important to think about at that point. And I think that's, it is interesting again with the, the types of clients you work with. I'm sure some even may, may, everybody wants to, you know, get a good deal and feel like they're being treated fairly on price, but because you're on that upper end of say even mobile detailers of you know i'm sure they could go out and find somebody cheap that's yeah starting up and willing to do thirty dollars or close to closer to it for a detail but yours are 300 plus i'm sure there's people that specifically like going with you though because again the branding around it you know by paying that price they feel this is the type of quality work they're going to get and they do so it, it is interesting how you can kind of play with that and figure out what people are willing to pay over the course of time. And because of the types of cars that you service, people are just going to be willing to pay that increase in price and a higher price point. Uh, Something you were talking about earlier, I'm curious, do you think when others start their service-based business or otherwise that they should discount those services to build up clients and, and experience? Or do you think that just happened to work well for you and others maybe shouldn't go that route? I think, I think everyone that's starting, unless they have a, funnel should discount their prices to begin with but it it depends on their experience too like if I was a plumber for 10 years and I became really good at plumbing and then I was starting a plumbing business on my own you know would it make sense to lower my prices 
eighty percent? Probably not. But um, one of the easiest ways to get clients in the beginning is to compete on price, right? Until you can kind of figure out how you're going to get your funnel going. But there's so many service-based businesses nowadays, like plumbing is probably a good example, where even if you have like, you, you see the top guy in Google has got 500 reviews and the next guy's got 250 and the next guy's got 100. And even if you have like 15 five-star reviews, which w- wouldn't be that hard. I mean, you could get your friends and family to probably leave 15 um, and your website's set up well. Because there's so much demand for plumbing, I think that you may not even necessarily have to have a low price to be able to get business, right? Just because the people that go online to search are going to just go down the list because a lot of them are going to be booked out too far or the website's not going to be built well. You know, I mean, for car detailing, it's maybe a little bit different. There probably isn't quite as much demand as something like that. I mean, recently we had that big storm and all those trees got knocked down, you know? And like when you'd call someone to have your trees that you got knocked down in your yard uh, chopped up, they were like, we're booked out for a month or two. And if you have a tree down in your yard, a lot of the times you don't want to wait a month. So you go to the next guy. And so those businesses that are in high demand, like a lot of service-based businesses are, you may not need to discount your prices as much as you think. But uh, for us, because we didn't have much experience, it made mm-hmm. sense. Yeah. And you got to recognize the demand at that time for whatever space you're in. And so, yeah, price is the one thing. I mean, obviously, you can always provide better quality work, but to attract new people specifically, price is the thing that you can adjust that immediately is going to catch people's attention um, until you've created that relationship and built that rapport for them to come back again and again. I know you've mentioned several times just the reviews that you've got on Google. I know you've got over 165 star reviews just on Google alone. Like, how how has that gotten built up to the point where it's you're the number one in that you know, in this industry, in this space, in Southwest Missouri, is it, is it something you've just specifically focused on and pushed out to the people that you've worked with, knowing that that's going to help your business big time? Or has it happened naturally or a combination of both? Most of the reviews were us asking the client at the time of a checkout, can I send you a review link? Would you leave us a review if I sent you a link? And we had a lot of people say yes, we'd send them a review link and they wouldn't leave one. So there's a formula there that once one every three or four people, maybe even five people that you send a review link to will actually fill it out. Um, But that's how we've grown most of those reviews. But it's been intentional the whole time we've known going into it that if we build our Google reviews, because Google is such a great platform for us to gain clients, that that's going to help us out. So, I mean, I remember when we had 40 reviews and the guy at the top had like 90. So a lot of guys were going with him, but you know, if, if he would fill up his calendar, they would come to us, you know, or maybe they saw we were mobile and he wasn't. So they would go with us for that reason. And then now people go with us and they don't even care if we're mobile or if have a shop, they just go with us because we have the best reviews and we, we kind of knew that would happen. And so we've really pushed that. Sure. You'd mentioned uh, car washes earlier and I am curious because in our area specifically, there are so many car washes that seem to be popping up and a lot more in the last, you know, two, three years than there ever were, you know, just seeming like a handful before that. But do you feel like that is somewhat a competition to you all on those exterior cleans and it reduces the amount of them? um, Or is it just a totally different service? I think it's a totally different service, but it is interesting how many have popped up over the past few years. Um, And that's just a testament to the the amount of capital that needed a place to be invested and how appealing that the car wash model was because it's low labor and uh, doesn't require a whole lot of experience to understand how to work one of those things, right? But um, no, I don't think that we compete with them. I think that uh, with what we're doing right now, um, a lot of our clients have car wash memberships and they'll never come to us weekly or monthly. But whether or not they have their car washed every day or not, they're probably going to come to us once a quarter or once every six months or so. It depends on the client. But our, our good clients, they come back every every year at the most and every quarter at the max. Mm. Yeah. Now for you in the day-to-day, w- what does the day-to-day look like for you at this point? Are you still fairly involved in the detailing itself? Is that hired out? 
how how much where where are you spending your time on on the business and in the business? Yeah, so I I always like to show my face to the team. Try try to do it every day, whether or not I'm actually doing the detailing or not. But I've stepped away from doing uh, the hands on detail work to focus more on back end and growing the business, and just making sure we understand our numbers, making sure that the team is on board with the vision for where we're going. Those things that I think really keep us moving forward. I've I've tried to focus on those things over the past uh, in 2023 in particular. But uh, I think that it's motivating for the team to see me come out and help them out with details. You know, even if I'm not working as hard as they are to a certain extent and the detail itself, I'm still there and encouraging them and talking with them. And uh, I think that that really helps because there's nothing worse than like the boss that you never see that everyone just kind of hates in that sense, you know? So I try not to be that guy and I try to really con- be considerate to how they might feel um, and in their shoes. Um, yeah. Build- building that company culture is huge of uh, people that are excited to come show up for work. They enjoy what they do. They see that, yeah, the the owners, the managers, whoever, they, they are a part of it. They're right there with them in that process. And yeah, there's definitely something motivating and encouraging to that to continue to to do good work has there been any issue with like quality control i mean i'm sure with these ceramic coats there is some a learning curve of how to do that uh i mean literally you know via you know the the name of the of what you do detailing it's very detail oriented and focused has there been much issue with that or do your do your people pick that up pretty well and and perform well so the interesting thing about that is if i go out to help with a detail or, or supervise I can always find things that my team is doing that I wouldn't, I wouldn't have done myself. I I would have probably been a little bit more picky, but you're never going to find employees that care as much about the business as you do. But what we found is that for most of our clients, they are, they aren't expecting the 100% perfection job that I might do. That may take me five hours, but the job that the rest of my team can do in four or three and a half which isn't quite up to my standard. Um, most of the people, they can't even tell the difference between the two. And they're more than happy with the service that they're provided. And the most important thing is the communication. Like all of my team has superb communication and are considerate. And uh, that's probably the most important thing that we teach when we onboard someone and we train them is just that customer communication. Um, and so if that's good, uh, the the detail skills, the little nitpicky things that will come over time, but we try not to sweat that mm-hmm. as much. Yeah, I, th- I think that's a good distinction there, and you know, majoring on the majors and the communication, and and still providing a good service, but naturally, like you're saying, uh, you're always gonna see things a little differently being the business owner and somebody who's even done it longer, perhaps. Uh, I wanted to ask if you is there one thing that you could maybe think of that you would do differently in getting your business off the ground the last few years? Uh, One thing I could have done differently, I think there's been a lot of distractions that were almost necessary for me. But looking back, it's like that was really unnecessary uh, for the business. Like the growth of the business was not affected at all by these small distractions. Like whether it's new ways I thought in which we can get business or little marketing things that I thought might help. It's like the main ways we get our business are through doing a superb job with the customer. And naturally they'll talk about it with their friends and Google. And I've said that all along, but then you get that shiny object syndrome of some new marketing method that takes up a lot of time. Uh, And I think that just really focusing on those things that you know, grow your business well. I think that is something that I probably would have I would have told myself three years ago just to keep in mind even more so than I I, I thought that I was. Yeah. And, and kind of in that same vein, uh, what advice would you give to, to anyone looking to branch off and start their own business, uh, whether it's car detailing or otherwise? Is, is there some specific advice you would give to somebody that's wanting to jump in and start something new? Yeah, I think so. Before I did car detailing, I did uh, I sold things online like Supreme and sneakers. I resold sneakers 
like I'd buy them from, you know, Nike with a bot and resell them for hire once they got sold out. And, and that was great, but I needed a little bit more of a competitive edge. So I think that that was important. I also needed someone that, like my brother, that could uh, complement my weaknesses because I knew that I had certain strengths and certain weaknesses. And so a, a big thing for me was building a team around me that we could work together well, that we wouldn't butt heads too much. Um, so that was really important. And, uh, and then most importantly, it was just sticking with something like having the ability to commit. And that comes at a different time for everyone. It doesn't necessarily have to be the first business that you build, but at a certain point in time, being able to commit and say like, this won't be easy, but I'm going to give it my all for a certain period of time. You know, I mean, the people that I know that are most successful, they've stuck with something for decades and it hasn't been, they jumped around from business to business every five years. Uh, the compound growth you see when you stick with something for 10, 20 years becomes exponential. That's really good. Yeah. And, and so there is, I think there is that element of you've got to take a look at what are your skill sets? What are you uh, capable in? And a lot of times people pursue different business ventures or or starting a company based off of what they're passionate around. And I can't remember exactly where I heard this, but I've heard that really and experienced it as well. It's not so much you need to pursue something that you're passionate in, but pursue something that you can get really good at. And when you perfect that and you dial that in and you become very competent there, then the passion will follow. Then you'll get excited to be in the business and work on it because you're good at it. You know, for most of us in starting any sort of company or business, we're not going to be the best in it. There's people that have experience. Uh, maybe, you know, our skill sets, our talents are geared towards this. But at the end of the day, you've got to go through the reps and time to build that up. And so I think oftentimes people can get distracted around, well, this is what I enjoy to do. This is what I'm passionate about. But then when they make that their job, that passion falls away versus getting really good at something. And then that's what excites them to to stick with it and grow. Uh, I don't know if you have experienced that at all with, with detailing even, but uh, it just seems like that happens more often than not in businesses and business owners I see. Yeah, I was never passionate about detailing. I always loved cars, but I'm passionate about relationships and I'm passionate about like business. But I think about that question often is like the reason that the people that are the most successful and what they do is the reason that they're most successful and the reason why they picked that career because they were passionate about it or because they stuck with it long enough to become good at it and that led the so-called passion. So I, I think that the latter is probably true the more and more I think about it, but uh, I think everyone's got to figure that out for themselves. And there's an element to it. I mean, I, I knew I was going to like real estate to a certain extent going into it. It's not like it was this completely bland, boring industry to be in. Like there is an element of of choosing something that you, you know, fits your skill set in, in an area you're like, but a lot of that does come along later, I think, as well. Uh, it, it, so kind of with that, I know you're saying focus and, and sticking with the business for the long term. W where do you see your um, Belk Mobile Detailing business going, say, in the next five years? Um, how involved will you be? Is that something you think you'll stick with and want to grow for the long term? Or will there be a pivot that you want to take a look at some other business or form of investing? Well, it's hard for me to know what the future holds and where my mind will be even in a month from now. But with where I'm at right now, I think that to my point I just made, I'm committing to doing what uh, I've been doing and building my business um, and becoming obsessed with my clients and the small things and trying to become the best in, in, that, in that sense. But there's only so much you can do with doing mobile car detailing in Springfield. And so we're always thinking bigger. And that's, I think, the biggest thing that I bring to our team is just having that vision to keep people motivated. I mean, we have we have really two trajectories in which we're wanting to grow, one of which is to be able to offer, um, you know, we've raised our prices over time, but now that we're growing our team, now that we've kind of tackled that, that niched, you know, in-depth, full detail process, we're now considering offering a select number of our clients more of an express service that they can get done more often. So really just increasing the frequency at which we're detailing clients. And the goal with that, from like a financial perspective, 
is if you can take a thousand people that are spending two, 300 bucks with you a year and turn them into people, a thousand people that are spending a thousand dollars with you, you now took your revenue from 200,000 to a million. So monetarily, that's where we're going to increase our sales is really just increasing the frequency at which people are coming to us. And people can only come to us so often when we have a three, $400 detail. Um, so we're, we're thinking about that. Um, and then the even bigger picture is we would love to explore the self-serve car wash industry and perhaps even figure out a way to, what, I guess what we notice from the outside looking in right now is a lot of the people that own these car washes and self-serve car washes, they, they aren't, they don't wash their car themselves and they aren't passionate about the business. They really just buy a model and kind of let the business model run. So we see a ton of opportunities there, knowing as much as we do about detailing to, in our opinion, to, to really blow that market up. And so there's something there too, that we're really looking at within the next like three years. I like that. I like that. Yeah. Got a couple options there of how to grow and yeah, just improve the business and next steps to take. Uh, before we go on to some of the, the last questions I'll ask you, uh, Besides de- your detailing company, are you involved in any other businesses or investing, um, you know, stock market, otherwise, uh, are there other types of investing? I know you said you did some online sales in the past. Yep. No, no other business other than the car detailing, but I, uh, I'm a big, um, I'm a big believer in investing with, uh, the times and with the biggest people in the world. And so I'm a huge investor into Tesla because I love Elon. And I love Tesla, and I think that I think that there's something to what he's building there. So any money that I can't put to work in my own business, I invest into Tesla. Um, but I've been I've been investing in the stock market. I don't talk about this much, mainly just because I don't. The more I I look into it, the more I feel like I don't know what I'm doing. So that's like the last thing I tell people when we when they're like, "What do you do?" It's like that's usually not something I talk about, just because. I mean, I've been investing and trading since I was like 10 and my dad showed it to me and it's, I love the stock market and I love investing and I've been trading like, uh, and looking at technical analysis, fundamental analysis. I've read tons of books on the stock market and investors, hedge funds. Um, and again, the more I look into it, the more I realize like how much there is to it and how much I don't know. So, um, any money that I have that I can't invest into my business, I, I typically tend to put it into 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 Tesla because uh, I think that in the next 10 years, I think that they are, in particular, Elon Musk, I think is just changing everything. And so um, I think that the the best place for in- investing your money, though, is probably your own business just because you can see a, a return on your, your capital that's a lot higher than investing into the stock market, mm-hmm. you know? I mean, our sales have grown over 100% year over year. It's pretty hard to get that with investing into the stock market, so- yeah, that's definitely, yeah, I can 100% agree there and in, in just investing right back into the business if you have that opportunity. I do remember meeting up with you, you know, back in the day and I don't know, at the time, I'm not super big into stocks still, um, you know, somewhat just passively, I guess, but I was moving my money around. I was investing in different companies for, I don't know, whatever reason. So I did learn that from you of like, just pick a company based off of like genuinely the company itself, their trajectory, the the owners, the you know, you know for for what they actually provide and the services versus any of these other factors that are so hard to follow and track because, like you said, there's a thousand things you could look at for you know for investing, but just pick a hand handful or just a few even that you're going to stick with for the long term, and then don't look at it and just let it go and let that be your investment for for later on. So that, I definitely think that's the best advice unless you're full time in this, you know, in that space. Yeah. And I see a lot of, a lot of business owners. I know they like, they make their money from their business and then they invest it into real estate. I'm sure you, you have a ton of customers that are like that and you see that. And for me, I've chosen not to invest into real estate with the money that I make excess from my business. But if I'm not investing it back into my business, like if there's nothing in the short term that I can invest and produce a higher return on my money. I invested into Tesla, um, but with only investing into one stock, and especially a stock as volatile as Tesla, I mean, you have to be willing to lose all your money, and uh, it's a massive risk. Um, but everyone looks at risk differently, you know. So, like for me, 
it would be riskier to not invest with that than two. That's how I think about it. So that's how I'm able to sleep every night. It's just by saying like the risk of not doing this is actually worse than the risk um, mm -hmm. of doing it. There's, so. there's definitely something to that of, yeah, what, what, what side of the risk equation are you going to be on, right? Are you going to put this into this investment that could set you up well for, you know, later time in life? And it's got a proven tra trajectory at, you know, even in that, or is it just going to stay in the bank account, which is going to lose to inflation over the course of time. And yeah, that's safer, you know, in a lot of people's eyes, but is it really? So there, there is definitely something to be, to be looked at when taking risk and investing and such. But yes, uh, well, moving on, I wanted to ask you a few of the questions we ask each guest on the podcast. So if you're ready for that, the first one is, what is one of the best pieces of advice that you have been given? Best piece of advice is probably everyone is running their own race at their own pace and business and life is really a marathon. So you look at some people and they're ahead now, at least in your eyes, but um, you got to run your own race. Um, another way that this has been put to me by one of my mentors was that there's stages to life. And so one of the great things about the modern world, in particular America that we live in, is that with no matter what stage in life you're in, you're going to have three warm meals, a bed to sleep in, and a hot shower for the vast, vast majority of people. And so whether or not you're driving around in your dream car or living in your dream house or making the kind of money you want, um, when you think about it like that and just how fortunate we are to be in the position we are, um, it, I think it just gives you, it, it lets you slow down, be a little bit more patient and, and, and really just like realize that you don't have to be at the end of the rainbow right now, that this is a journey and that everyone's running their own pace. I think that's so huge. I mean, in a society today where everybody's life is online and we know about it, we see, you know, the people that are absolutely doing the best in the world. Um, even to people locally that we know that put their very best online or, you know, yeah, we see these successes and whatnot. It can be so easy to, you know, have that comparison approach of what am I doing compared to this person, so-and-so. But yeah, at the end of the day, you've got to look at your own trajectory and growth, your own disciplines and habits that are going to get you to the goals that you know you're capable of and just dial in there and time will tell. Um, but, but regardless, yeah, we, you can look at those things like you're saying three, three meals a day, a place to sleep. And even in and of itself, that is enough. And we can be satisfied with that and thankful for that. So I think that's a, that's a huge, huge piece that you just talked about. It is hard sometimes to be grateful for that when you don't have perspective. So that's why I think like traveling and reading and history is so important because it helps give us that perspective of how fortunate we are to be with where we're at. If you don't have that perspective, then those basic things that we are given in America may seem like nothing, you know, and you look at everyone on social media and you may think that, you know, you are at this very low place, but in reality, we're actually doing extremely well in, in history as far as the, the things that were, the, the technologies that we have and, and we, we don't ever go hungry. And I mean, it's just it's pretty incredible with where, where we are as a society to where like even the people that are at the lowest points, um, are, they still do, they're doing pretty well, um, comparatively to a lot of other countries and a lot of other times, um, and it's very important to look at. It really is. It is. Well, number two, then what is one of your favorite business books? I like reading biographies because I want to learn directly from the person. And so when I just, I'm about finished reading that just came out was uh, Elon Musk's new bio biography by Walter Isaacson, who's written books about Steve Jobs. So, I mean, I would say that if you want to be the best at business, there's no better place than the best person who's worth the most amount of money. And that's Elon. I would learn directly from the top. You know, I mean, another good book is The E-Myth, which kind of talks about scaling your business. Um, and thinking about your business, not just from a passion perspective of like, I love baking and I'm going to open up a bakery, but rather, how am I going to build this bakery to be the best bakery for my customers? That was actually an example that the book gives. Um, that's another really good book, but uh, the Elon Musk book, if I had to recommend, would be the one. I like that. Yeah. Bi biographies are have become more and more of a favorite of mine. I know we've 
read some some of the same ones. So it's yeah, it's really neat looking into the actual lives and examples that those people have. Uh, number three, then, what is one character trait you notice that successful people commonly share? Commitment. Going back to what we were talking about just a minute ago, being able to commit to something. There's not one person I know that's been successful long term that hasn't committed. So if you see someone that's got five businesses, um, and for each of them, they've only been running them a handful of years, just be careful. And it's the people that have been doing what they have for 10, 20 years that have committed to that one thing. I think that you'll learn the most from. Yep. Couldn't, couldn't agree more with you there. Well, the last is simply where can people connect with you? Maybe even where they could reach out for uh, detailing services, but um, just to reach out to you in general. Belk Mobile Detailing is our website name, BelkMobileDetailing.com. Our Instagram is uh, just Belk Mobile Detailing. You can find us on there. Um, and anything personal, you could always send it to my uh, my business email, which is just uh, josh.belk at yahoo.com. Very nice. Very nice. Well, Josh, appreciate, appreciate you coming on. Great conversation hearing about the business and excited for where things are going with you. So uh, thanks for taking the time. Yeah, thanks for having me, Lincoln. This was Absolutely. a blast. Absolutely. Thank you all for tuning in to this episode of the Growth Circle Podcast. If you found value from it like I did, please leave us a five-star review and rating, and we will catch you on the next one. Thanks.